Welcome everyone to our Physics Beyond Community events, now 2024. We have Nave back again with a new project that he's going to be talking about. Um, this time is something completely different. You might remember last time he was talking about using AI to save his native language, Kangri. So this was large language models. He sticked with a computer, but this time he's looking at something completely different. And that is kind of how to predict floods and help to do uh, uh, to establish like early warning systems uh, so that uh, the tragedies that keep happening around the globe kind of I mean okay they will happen but that people <laughs> um, people's lives are saved or like more people's lives are saved because uh, as you can imagine if the warning is late uh, if uh, you know the authorities realize too late that it is too dangerous uh, then um, people are evacuated too late and that uh, usually means death um, so here we go, Nave, the stage is yours, and uh, we're looking forward to hear about your project. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pa. All right, so I firstly, I named the project Watergate um, because I thought, you know, it would be quite funny if someone read Watergate as a project, given its historical uh, significance. So uh, for starters, uh, unlike its namesake, uh, Watergate, I, I believe is actually a good thing. Um, so Watergate, uh, just a brief introduction and why I started this project. So in June and July of 2023, um, I was away at the Wolfram High School summer program. And while I was away at camp, my hometown of Delhi was flooded for the first time in 45 years, as well as North India, where I went a lot um, to this one state called Himachal Pradesh, to conduct research for Kangri. That state uh, witnessed terrible floods and there was a lot of uh, devastation over there. And I was particularly shocked that Delhi was flooded because Delhi is supposedly an arid zone. So, you know, sort of inspired by that, uh, or I guess dismayed by that loss of life, I started to, I uh, started Watergate with a friend of mine from camp. His name is George Cheng. Um, and so we worked, uh, quite intensively on this project. Uh, we've been working for the past six months um, and um, it has been quite, um, you know, eventful. Uh, this summer, I will be interning at the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing and collaborating with ISRO, which is the Indian Space and Research Organization to implement Watergate nationally and test its efficiency against other state-of-the-art flood prediction models. And I'm also working with Dr. Mohammad Ali Khorbani from the University of Tabriz, which is a university in Iran, which is well known for its water engineering. Uh, with Dr. Khorbani, I plan on extending Watergate's functionality to predict the morphological changes in lakes in semi-arid and arid regions, because that has an impact uh, on not only the local people, but it has a global impact as well. Uh, one of our case studies for that is the Aral Sea, which was this, which was the world's uh, Aral Lake, which was the world's fourth largest lake at one time, and now it's a desert. So we're sort of trying to understand how human processes as well as climatic processes uh, play a role in the morphological change of lakes over time. Um, anyways, so here's a brief snapshot of Watergate. Uh, let me just zoom out a bit. So uh, just so that you guys can see some of the cool graphics that we've created over time, I'll just go over some of them uh, later, but just so that you can see. And uh, the abstract is, well, more or less uh, a little technical introduction. Uh, we started off, well, Watergate is a computational model uh, that utilizes a multi-paradigm approach. Uh, we realized that not a lot of flood prediction models utilize different technologies. And so for this project, I decided not only to go with the computational approach, which Wolfram language is quite well known for, but also for a neural network approach. Um, and that's something that I think benefited the project quite a bit, uh, having that sort of interdisciplinary blend of computational uh, mathematics as well as uh, neural networks and machine learning. So I think that's something that's quite helpful. We used computational hydrology. Um, you know, we analyzed the structure of rivers in 2D and then converted it into 3D. Then we used, uh, we started off by using a basic uh, method known as the rational method, which is sort of the base model for uh, computational hydrolo 
hydrology modeling. And then we moved on to uh, various other methods uh, that were more accurate. And yeah, we've also developed a couple of uh, cool extensions. I mentioned the one with Dr. Korbani. I've also implemented a um, API call for real-time uh, satellite imagery data in the Wolfram language, which is quite interesting. We also use statistical analysis. Uh, if you see this, this is the Kumaraswamy distribution. And so, yeah, uh, that's something that, you know, we, uh, we've used a multi-paradigm approach. Um, I think the coolest part about using a multi-paradigm approach is that I was able to use a concept from cellular biology known as cellular automaton to model flooding analysis, which I think is quite cool because uh, that's something you don't get to see every day, uh, you know, um, concepts from biology being implemented to predict floods. That, that's quite interesting in my opinion. And so, all right, um, I'll just sort of go over uh, the thought process and um, what, what each sort of main section of the uh, code does. Uh, before that, uh, you can probably access, uh, you can access all of this on GitHub. Um, it's, it's there in the link that Dr. Bar posted. Um, the, and also, if you go to the documentation, you can see that I've mentioned the code as well as like a quite a large snippet of code as well as the uh, images and the output of the code. And the reason for that is that the Wolfram language is a, propri a proprietary software. I realized that. Uh, and in order to make it as accessible as possible, uh, I've decided to include all the code and the output uh, alongside in the documentation uh, so that it's not really a traditional documentation in the sense that it explains what the code does, but it's more accessible for the general public. Um, so yeah, it, it contains quite a lot of a code and uh, as a result it's like quite a heavy documentation but i believe that uh, that's for the best because uh, that way people won't have to download wolfram uh, language specifically to view one project uh, and that's something that i plan to do for other projects that i'm doing in wolfram language as well okay um the first step was isolating rivers from maps uh, you can see we just took an example of paris over here and so the reason, uh, the way to do this is using polygon clustering and color recognition. So vector minimal is a geo background, which we specifically chose because it had a specific color of blue that was constant for all its maps. So by, al by allowing you to choose a geo background, you can easily uh, use um, image manipulation and color processing to select a particular shade of blue in the map. So that way, is a particular shade of blue in the map will always correspond to a river or a water body. And that's uh, precisely what we did. After loading the geographics, we chose, uh, we wrote some code to select the cases where the RGB color was this particular blue. And we used this polygon clustering code uh, to get that. Um, now, the problem with this is that it selects sort of all the blue uh water bodies so you can see there's quite a bit of discrete water bodies over here which is separate from the river and while that they may be interesting for other purposes they're not really useful for us so we convert it to a binary image using binarize and then we invert the color so it was white and black and then we convert it into black and white and then we use some uh you know image processing uh, tools uh, that are very available in the Wolfram language to sort of clean um, the river. So uh, clean, clean the image. So we have a cleaner image of just the river over here and the river delta basin. Um, then we convert it into a morphological graph, which is quite interesting if you want to do things like determining the Strala stream order. Uh, if you want to determine the Strala stream order, it's very important to have a graph instead of just a, an image. So morphological graph allows you to convert, uh, to create a graph from an image, which is quite interesting. Um, you know, and of course there are a couple of faults in this graph. Firstly, you can see the, the glaring fault is this loop over here. Um, you know, you, you don't really see a loop over here. So in order to sort of, uh, you know, get rid of the defects that the morphological graph has, we again use uh, some image processing and a mathematical tool known as the transitive reduction graph. What this does is it iteratively eliminates edges uh, that contribute to cycles. So what we have over here is a 
graph without any cycles, which is very important if we want to do something like analyze where the river branches off. Um, and that's quite interesting. That's exactly what we do next. We find the stream splits on morphological graphs. Um, you know, um, these are the points in black and white. If you can sort of, I probably should have mapped this on to this graph, uh, which is what I do in the next slide, sort of. But um, this is these are essentially the branch points where the river branches off. And if you can see this, we map them onto the river man with and without its branching points. So you can see uh, it's more or less quite accurate uh, because it shows exactly where the river branches off. So you can see it over here, it branches off into two distinct tributaries. Over here, there's a upstream tributary. Over here, there's a downstream one. Over here, it's sort of branching into uh, a delta basin. And over here, it's branching off into an upstream tributary as well. Uh, there are a couple of extraneous points for smaller tributaries, uh, but I believe that's still uh, quite good uh, because this is a non-trivial task. Um, because polygon clustering in satellite imagery is a difficult task, not only because of the weird images that people have, uh, that satellite imagery generates, uh, but also due to the fact that, uh, you know, color processing uh, isn't, um, isn't perfect, of course, um, but still, I think it's quite interesting that we were able to get this. Okay, and so after we did this, uh, just wrote some code to map the river Marne back onto uh, the map where it was, so you can probably see the enhanced effect of it. And so now that we've sort of, you know, gone over the functions, I'll just go over them quite quickly. We first extracted rivers from maps, then we applied some color processing and uh, transitive graph functions to get a uh, graph without a cycle, and found the stream splits uh, using morphological graph points, the branch points. Uh, after that, we mapped it back onto the map, uh, mapped, the, mapped the river back onto the map, and now what we're ready to do is we're ready to apply it to a simple river system. So we took the example of Jackson, Mississippi as a simple river system. Um, you know, we got the, we applied the same functionality as before. Uh, first we, uh, you know, converted it into a binary image. Then we selected the river. You can see that it's, uh, this is not really accurate right now, but we will utilize uh, color processing functions to convert it into a morphological graph, which is exactly what we do in the next uh, slide. Now, this time, what we decided to do is we actually decided to convert it into a three-dimensional graph. So if you open this code in the Wolfram language, you'll actually be able to visualize uh, and zoom into the points where the river branches, which I think is quite interesting as well. And uh, application to complex river systems, we chose the example of Anchorage in Alaska, applied the same functionality, and you can see that this is quite complicated as compared to the previous example. Um, and we applied image processing functions to get a three-dimensional graph of, as, of this as well. So in conclusion, I believe that uh, the code that we ran is quite interesting uh, in the term, in the sense that it provides an accurate three-dimensional as well as two-dimensional overview of where a river branches for both simple and complex river systems. Um, okay, now we move on to 2D satellite mapping onto the 3D model. Uh, the first step of this section is to find a way to take satellite imagery, uh, and we use geoimage uh, in the Wolfram language, which is a quite an uh, important function. Now, in order to extract river information, uh, we clean the data and uh, apply the same image processing functions as before, uh, but this time we recolor it um, to give it a distinct color, and then we place it back on to the uh, river. Then we use the geo elevation data, which, which is in the form of DEM, which is a digital elevation model file. And we create a list plot 3D. So it's basically like a three dimensional array, which tells you, which gives you this beautiful three dimensional plot, uh, relief plot of where, uh, of Anchorage, Alaska, uh, of Juneau, Alaska, with the river uh, in the specific color that you want, which is quite important to visualize. Uh, again, if this was in the Wolfram language, you can probably play around with this and you can zoom into the specific points uh, of interest. Uh, unfortunately, GitHub doesn't really allow us to do that, um, but 
still, um, if you if you were to run this code in the Wolfram language, it works pretty well. So this is just a three uh, like an image of the three D model that we generated. Um, moving on, uh, we move on to a relief plot for floodplains. A relief plot essentially tells you how much rainfall uh, is required to flood an area, uh, which is quite important uh, because in the case of Delhi, it was flooded due to rain, uh, a lot of rain, as well as the Yamuna River being diverted. So th that's important uh, to understand that, you know, rain affects how a place can be flooded quite a lot, especially if it's a semi-arid place. So we used the relief plot function in Wolfram language and combined it with the manipulate code uh, so that you can essentially see uh, if you were to run this in Wolfram language and you change the slider, you'll be able to see where exactly uh, the Wolfram, uh, where exactly the uh, places are flooded at what rainfall. Uh, and this is again for Juneau, Alaska. And then you can sort of create a three-dimensional uh, list plot 3D, just like we did over here. But this time you can see uh, visibly see that quite a lot of it is underwater, and that's because it's been flooded due to a large amount of rainfall. Okay, uh, now we come on to the prediction part. So far we've been visualizing quite a bit, and now we move on to using the rational method for prediction. So the rational method formula is Q is equal to CIA, where Q is equal to the peak rate of runoff, C is equal to the runoff coefficient, I is equal to the average intensity, and A is equal to the watershed area. Um, we received this data uh, from the USGS, and after going through the runoff coefficients for the rational formula, we were able to uh, create an algorithm that converts the closest colors to the colors in our key. Um, so these are all based on colors uh, on the C value. Uh, and then, you know, we applied some image processing functions uh, and quite a lot of, you know, cleaning up. Uh, I admit it doesn't look very pretty right now, uh, but, you know, I, I believe it's it's the fastest approach. Uh, so we went with this and we mapped the colors that we have in our map to the colors taken in the USGS uh, and received the C value for that. So for Juneau, Alaska, the C value is 0 0.633755. As a brief reminder, the C is the runoff coefficient, which is an empirical coefficient. Um, so we determined that by using image processing functions. Then I is the intensity of rainfall. Uh, previous literature found that the intensity of rainfall for flash floods is around four to six inches. And so by taking the rainfall data of uh, using weather data in the Wolfram language for the past 20 years, we were able to find uh, the I calculation as I is equal to 4.9, uh, which is uh, again, uh, quite interesting how you can sort of just use a couple of lines of code to understand how water, uh, how, you know, weather data has been in a place for over 20 plus years. You know, if you think about it, meteorologists in the previous era uh, had to, you know, run these simulations on very large computers. And it's quite um, interesting to see Wolfram Language's computational power, which allows us to do that. Uh, anyways, we have the C value, we have the I value, and now we get the A value, which is just the area of Juno. Uh, which is 25600. And doing uh, multiplying all of that, we have Q is equal to CIA. So we multiply all of them uh, to get 7948982. Um, then we apply some more, uh, you know, just some calculations to convert uh, the Q to square feet and then multiply by 3600 to convert seconds to hours. Uh, we get 142.99 as the elevation increases uh, 1,422.29 feet if it rained for 750 hours straight in Juneau, Alaska, which is obviously not very practical. But what we can determine from this is we can determine a linear relation between how uh, much it rains for how many hours it rains and how much what the elevation increases. Um, anyways, uh, we take the using our previous relief plot techniques, we uh, create a relief plot for Juno, and then we map it on to uh, the three dimensional plot. And now we can sort of use the entire knowledge that we have 
for a simple river system, uh, which is Jackson in Mississippi. We've used it before. Uh, we're going to run the entire same calculations for Q is equal to C by CIA again, and we're going to visualize it in a three dimensional uh, model. And so we do exactly that, uh, calculate the permeability, the intensity and the area. And after that, we create a three dimensional model uh, as well as the relief plot. So we simulated 152.786 feet of heavy rainfall over 200 hours will lead to this elevation. And again, uh, just to ensure that our uh, data is, you know, uh, our algorithm and our processing is correct, not only for simple river systems, but also for complex river systems. We apply it to a complex river system. Uh, Anchorage in Alaska was an example of a complex river system, as mentioned before. And we do the exact same thing, get the values. And this time we get that 1,527.86 feet of heavy rainfall over 2,000 hours in Alaska will give us this uh, list 3D plot and this relief plot. And so, you know, tying everything together, uh, this is just for fun. And this is just, this is actually like uh, quite an interesting piece of code. We were able to sort of map a three dimensional model of the river Marne uh, over the flooded analysis. So if you go here, you can see that this is the river Marne with the, uh, without the transitive reduction graph for right now. We map the vertices of the river onto a map and we can see, uh, you can essentially see the River Marne going through uh, Paris when it's flooded. Um, so this is just for fun. I don't really think it has that much importance, but it's an interesting, uh, you know, computational task which we accomplished. All right. So so far uh, we've gone over uh, a lot of stuff. Just to sort of recap, we've gone over Q is equal to CIA. We've gone over relief plots, image processing, et cetera, et cetera. And just scrolling up and down so you guys can see some of the graphics. Uh, now, what we do is we talk about uh, the population density model. So why is population density important? Well, why were floods in Delhi uh, quite impactful, uh, even though they weren't extremely you know, potent floods. The reason for that was its population density. And the reason is that the, the calculating the population density can tell us how at risk an area is for flooding, which is an important metric to measure. And these are some built in using some built in functions from the Wolfram language. We were able to visualize uh, the population density for New York. So if you see over here, it shows more people per uh, square kilometer and then the as you can see you can probably read the color plot so red more red means more uh, densely populated um <clears throat> after that we created a population density map of new york using uh population over area texture density and uh, some other image processing functions uh, essentially what we did was instead of relying on the Wolfram language to uh, automatically generate data we converted our own um, you know color for the legend. Uh, and that's uh, important because sometimes the inbuilt data in Wolfram language can be quite misleading. Um, so anyways, this is a three dimensional plot of uh, the population density model of New York. All right. And uh, again, just to recap, this will probably tell us where exactly uh, it's important to make sure that important flooding protocols are in place because obviously people uh, where people live more, uh, that's the place where it, it's important to ensure that flooding protocols are in place. Um, next, we move on to large scale, uh, you know, uh, river modeling uh, using river width. Now, this is quite an important uh, thing. So how exactly do you measure or model the width of a river? Well, one very novel way to do this is using bridge lengths. So Essentially, the idea is, uh, and it's not a perfect model, but it's quite accurate. Um, where you have larger bridges or you know wider bridges, that's where it's the river is going to be wider, or you know it's going to be, it's going to have a larger width. Um, and so, why is it why is this important? It's because you can't accurately measure the width of a river that branches a lot and that changes in its morphological shape year to year, like the Mississippi. 
um, and you can't accurately measure every point of it, and you can't really do that. But what you can do is you can use the um, bridge lengths uh, across uh, the Missouri and the Mississippi to model the width of the river, uh, which is what we did. Um, so this is sort of a model of where the Missouri River is wide and where it's not, not as wide, where it's narrow. And so th this is for the Missouri River, but then a more comprehensive example is one that incorporates river delta in relation to the Mississippi River. And uh, this is uh, this is a map that we did that, uh, that did, does exactly that, which is modeling the width of the river by looking at its bridges data, which is more readily, readily available than the width of a river at a particular point. Um, all right, now that we've done that, uh, we can go on to using bridges and their data. So again, we ran some code. Um, in the Wolfram language to get a filtered entity class, which is basically a list of uh, bridges that cross the Hudson and its tributaries. Uh, and so this is a list of the, the bridges over there. Then we use a geo region value plot like we did earlier uh, and plot it. Then we show the population density of New York and the length of the bridges in the same graph. So you can see, uh, you know, there seems to be some correlation between the population density of a place and the length of its uh, and the width of its longest bridge, on at least for the Hudson River and its tributaries. And so, in order to sort of test this hypothesis, we plot the graph of the Mississippi River with respect to the population density of the United States. Uh, and this is what that graph is. All right. Moving on, we again, we utilize the fact that bridges have a lot of data, especially inbuilt data in the Wolfram language. We calculate something known as the bridge density, which is the density of a city, uh, which is the percentage of area covered by bridges to the percentage of area covered by water for a city. So these are all, these are all the bridges in New York. And we apply some image processing functions to get that uh, the percentage of area covered by bridges in New York is around 2.9%. Now we calculate the percentage of area covered by water in New York, which is around 18%. And so we get a, a, a ratio over here. And we wrap this neatly in a function so that you can access it for any place. Um, then moving on, we use dams and their data. We can extract dams from satellite images, uh, which is very important because a lot of floods are flash floods especially are caused due to dams for example in 2013 uh, the tehri dam in india flooded which is the dam uh, coincidentally or not the dam that we're going to talk about um, and it's quite important to study the um, area and the impacts that a dam has on its neighboring locations so uh, we extract dams from satellite images by applying image processing functions as before um, then we binarize the image and uh, apply the same code as before in the <clears throat> bridge density part to get that the Terry Dam covers approximately 2.4.4169% of its surrounding area, where the surrounding area is determined by uh, the inbuilt 500 by 500 grid uh, of the Wolfram language. <clears throat> Anyways, now what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to compute the volume and area of dam using satellite imagery and again this is important uh, because it's not like you can find estimates of how big and how uh, you know deep a dam is but to, you can't accurately measure it at every point especially when it rains and due to rainfall the reservoir levels can increase and decrease rapidly uh, so the best way to do this is actually using satellite imagery and then we create a dam contour manually, which is we essentially select uh, points using the geo coordinates tool in Wolfram language, and we get the area, uh, which is 27.6 uh, kilometers square, which is relatively accurate uh, for the Terry Dam. Uh, moving on, uh, oh sorry, this is not the Terry Dam, this is another dam, uh, but it's relatively accurate. Uh, the the area was measured to be around 30, around 29 kilometers squared. So I think it's quite accurate. I believe they measured this extraneous part, uh, which they counted as a map, uh, which they counted as a dam as well. We did not uh, choose to measure that uh, because I, I believe that doesn't really play an important role. So uh, this is relatively accurate. 
Then we use the image mesh functionality, which is uh, useful when we compare one bridge to another. Uh, then we find the depth of a dam. So if you if you recall that there are two parts to this, there's finding the volume and the area. And since, since we've already found the area, now what we're going to do is we're going to try and, and find the depth of it. Uh, and again, so finding the depth is uh, not a very easy task, especially if it rains quite a bit. So the best way to do it is actually to look at satellite imagery. Um, now what we do is we use bathymetric functions uh, to, to find the volume. Um, the output for this uh, will be mentioned later. Uh, so the first one is using pure bathymetric functions to find volume, and the second one is using neural networks. So this is actually quite interesting. There's this uh, pre-trained model available known as the single image depth perception chart. What this essentially does, and you can look at this net chain, is that it looks at an image and predicts how it predicts with a, a large amount of accuracy how deep uh, the object in that image is going to be. Essentially, the depth of the object uh, in in the wild as well as in concrete uh, uh, concrete cities. So we use the pre-trained model uh, and we use it for satellite prediction uh, of the dam and we get a list plot 3D value of it, uh, which is quite interesting to see the indent of the dam uh, that is made, as you can clearly see over here. All right, and now we move to plotting dams and bridges of the same map. Um, and this is just more of you know collecting data, creating an entity class, getting data of the dams and rivers, and this is what we do. Uh, this is a graph of the dams, uh, the long dams and uh, you know long bridges in of the uh, Mississippi River, and as you can clearly see, there is quite a lot of correlation between uh, the location of tall dams and wide bridges. Uh, which seems to indicate that where a river is wide, that's probably the ideal place to build a dam. Um, okay, so we created a tree graph earlier uh, using the morphological graph 3D function, and now we can essentially create a, a stream order using the uh, Horton's Charles stream order method. Uh, the algorithm for implementing this is as follows. Uh, you can probably read this. It's quite interesting. Uh, and the usual way to do this, if you were using an iterative approach, uh, would be to do a breadth first search and then assign the value of i uh, to the nodes in a postfix order. But we use the inbuilt functionality of the Wolf language, so we can just uh, bypass all the iterative programming and get the uh, Horton Stallus free model uh, for a river. So this is generated by this code over here. Um, anyways, we move on to statistical analysis. Uh, you know, there's I, I should probably go into more detail regarding the statistical uh, statistical analysis. So essentially, uh, there are things known as the continuous probability uh, distributions and discrete probability distributions. And what they do is they help us analyze the flooding uh, analysis and the lake and uh, lake rivers. Uh, so, so they essentially help us um, look at the water levels for different lakes and rivers and perform statistical analysis on them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to switch my screens for one minute uh, because this is more accurately described in the paper that, that was shared. So we consider the case of 101 years of annual peak flow data of the Rio Grande in New Mexico. Um, and so the length of the Rio Grande is around 3,000 kilometers, which makes it the fourth longest river in North America. And essentially, we plot the uh, annual peak flow data for the Rio Grande River. Um, and you can see that it's sort of jagged, but it has a few spikes. And we plot the values on a histogram, and we realize the data is quite skewed towards the right. And so by applying a logarithmic function, we can sort of ensure that it's a little bit more balanced and you can see it sort of follows uh, the bell distribution over here. Now we can find the mean values of the logarithm of the peak flow values and the standard deviation and create a probability density function uh, using Wolfram language's inbuilt functionality, uh, which is the log normal distribution functionality. 
in which the maximum entropy probability distribution for the random variate is measured. In this case, the random variate is simply the annual peak flow data. And we overlay it uh, on top of the histogram. So this is a probability density function and the histogram. Um, and then we sort of get the standard deviation and uh, the mean, and we correct the PDF to get a more accurate version of it. Uh, which is the extreme value distribution PDF, a probability distribution function. Uh, again, uh, there are two types of uh, distribution functions. There's like uh, probability distribution functions. There, there are also cumulative, cumulative distribution functions. And so uh, the cumulative distribution functions is obtained by summing up the probability density function and getting the cumulative probability for a random variable uh, by using the values of alpha and beta. So uh, the cumulative distribution function using the extreme value distribution PDF that we used before is this. And we also look at another cumulative distribution function uh, using the log normal distribution, which utilizes the mean values that we calculated over here, as well as the standard deviation as before. And so we can see the intersection of both of these cumulative discrete function graphs, which shows us uh, that there's, there's quite a bit of overlap between them. Um, Lastly, what we do is we perform statistical analysis for lakes and other small water bodies by taking the example of lake maids water levels and then calculating the Kumaraswamy distribution for it. So the Kumaraswamy distribution is actually a double bounded distribution in a continuous probability distribution defined in the interval of zero to one, which is quite important for uh, you know river analysis and flooding. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to move on to, uh, I think I'm, I have to cover quite a lot of stuff. And so I'm going to probably move on to uh, the most important aspect of Watergate, which is, I believe, um, using cellular automata for uh, flooding analysis. So flooding in urban areas, uh, you know, can cause damage to infrastructure. So the, we have two different ways to model flooding using cellular automata, which is again a concept from biology. Uh, the first one assumes uniform rainfall and hydrological losses are not considered. Uh, this is known as the bathtub model. And the second model is a weighted cellular automata model, which enables a more realistic representation of water flow dynamics accounting for the physical limitations of water velocity using Manning's formula, which is a very important formula in um, predicting the water flow through a particular region. So we run it on three different locations, uh, Atlantic City, uh, the Delaware River in New Jersey, and Princeton in New Jersey. So we start by Atlantic City and getting the geo elevation data for it and storing it in a 2D quantity array. And then we create a visualization that allows us to manipulate the sea level and observe which regions would be flooded, much similar to the one that we did before with the rainfall and the relief plot. Uh, and we do the same using the two-dimensional thing and the three-dimensional thing. So this is the three-dimensional manipulate, and this is the two-dimensional manipulate using relief plot. Then we do the same for the Delaware River and uh, plot it again in 2D and 3D. Uh, but unfortunately, water flow has many other factors than just the elevation. And so water doesn't necessarily flow to where it has the lowest elevation. And so while the bathtub model that we've generated captures the general idea of what, where water will travel, our cellular automata model considers more factors of how water flows and how um, more accurately we can predict where the water will uh, flow. And so just a brief introduction to cellular automata. It's a approach to, they are discrete models that simulate the behavior of individual cells. So you can sort of see that these are cells and you can generate, uh, you know, the behavior of these cells by a predetermined rule. Um, what we do is we take the one Neumann uh, neighborhood for each cell, which means that a central cell has four neighbors adjacent to it. Of course, you can probably consider these four as well, uh, but we consider these four. And so water flows from the central cell to its neighboring cells, depending on uh, the water flow rules that the model we've generated submits. So we create a seven by seven graph of it, and we consider vertex nine. 
the neighborhood graph of vertex nine will show the four neighbors of vertex nine, which are colored red. Um, and this is just like a demonstration of the von Neumann uh, cellular automata that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we move on to creating a simple cellular automata model uh, in which the rule is the most important. Uh, and so the guiding transition of the rule is that a central cell gives water to its neighboring cells of one unit of water depth. If it has a higher water level than its neighbor, then you apply this rule to every cell in the grid, iterating over the water depths until they're relatively constant. So you can see that this is quite already quite an interesting model, uh, which is more sophisticated uh, than the than just looking at elevation data and sort of figuring out where water will go. Um, so after that, we get the data using geo elevation data uh, as before, and we create two helper functions: one to get the water depth uh, and add one, and the other to subtract one. And so the rule again is uh, mentioned as before. Uh, the center cell will not give water if it's less than one. Otherwise, its water depth will be negative, which is, of course, not possible. And so after we've applied the rule that we mentioned before, we have a three-dimensional uh, sort of uh, video uh, that I can probably share over here as well. Um, it's a very uh, interesting video uh, that shows us how exactly you can um, look at uh, the flooding analysis of a city especially in New Jersey. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll probably post this later because I'm sort of running out of time. Uh, but the, you can essentially, if you paste this code in the Wolfram language, it'll generate a video that shows you uh, that models flooding using cellular automata. And so this was quite a simple model, really, uh, because we just looked at a couple of, you know, uh, grid functions and noticed that the main cell will uh, give its water to the neighboring cells if its oh, depth is greater. But now it's time to do a more complex model, which is a weighted cellular automata model. Uh, this model is called the WCAD, and it is uh, it was mentioned in a paper by Gwydalyn et al. Uh, in 2016. And so uh, we essentially move to the same, uh, same uh, thing. We get the elevation data, create the grid graph, but this time the area of the cell is divided by the area of a particular region divided by the number of cells it covers. Um, and so we sort of model the area of a particular region by looking at cellular automata data and a small tolerance is set to help reduce oscillation. And we set the water initial water depth to five at every cell, which means that we just set it to five inches of rainfall, which is quite standard for flash floods, really, because we uh, noted in previous literature that the normal amount for uh, in, in inches of rainfall is four to six for flash floods. And so these are the steps um, that we require uh, to distribute the volume being transferred from the central cell to the neighborhood using a weighted system. So firstly, we identify the downstream cells. Then we compute the weights based on the available storage volume. We compute the total volume leaving the central cell. And for each downstream cell, we calculate new intercellular volume. And so we find we identify the downstream cells by finding the difference in water level between the center and the ith neighbor. Uh, and then we find the available storage volume of the ith neighbor cell of the center and determine whether a center has downstream cells or not. Then for computing the weight, we've we define the following helper functions, which is min store volume and max store volume. Uh, min store volume finds the minimum available storage volume between all the neighbor cells of a central cell and max store max storage volume does the same. Uh, and M cell finds the index of the cell with the maximum available storage volume. After that, we assign weights uh, to the neighborhood, as mentioned in the paper. Uh, that was Gwydalyn et al. in 2016. We use the available storage volume uh, divided by the total storage volume plus the minimum storage volume. And, the, and we also uh, assign another weight, which is the minimum storage volume divided by the minimum storage volume and the total storage volume. And so, after that, we assign another uh, weight, which is the total intercellular volume, which is the volume of the water that leaves the cell. Uh, again, we 
uh, use the total uh, intercellular volume uh, is limited by the fact that the amount of water that exists in the center cell cannot be infinite. So the amount of water that exists in the center cell is the limiting uh, reagent for the total intercellular volume. Um, so, you know, uh, here are a couple of other helper functions. We used uh, something known as Manning's formula and the critical flow equation to find the limiting velocity. And we also found the limiting volume based on the minimum of the lim two limiting velocities that we calculated. Uh, after, you know, iterating over these, we used a depth uh, chart and we essentially calculated the weights for each model uh, by looking at the geo elevation data of New Jersey. And this is, uh, if you paste this code in the Wolfram language, you'll be able to see the visualization of what, what Atlantic City, if it were ever flooded, would look like. And we also apply this to Princeton in uh, New Jersey. Uh, and so this is a relief plot of Princeton and what it would look like if it were ever flooded. So the darker areas uh, represent more water and the lighter areas represent less water. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, hexagonal cellular automata, it, this is something that we're experimenting with right now. Um, you know, uh, it's not fully implemented yet. Uh, but our next step is to sort of use a more complex cellular automata model. So if you if you notice over here, when we create a graph, uh, we're essentially using a rectangular cellular automata. What we can actually do is we can use a more accurate version of this, which is a hexagonal cellular automata, and that will allow us to predict flooding even more accurately than we did before. And so uh, in, in a gist, this is what the Watergate project was about. Uh, you can see that we used a lot of interdisciplinary, um, you know, techniques to model flooding analysis. And I think uh, that's something that's quite important uh, in the field of flood prediction and computational hydrology, which is using novel ideas, uh, not only from, uh, you know, biology, but also from, you know, using mechanical engineering, such as Manning's formula to find the limiting velocity. And of course, using real time satellite imagery and statistical analysis as well, as well as using neural nets like we did for finding the depth of the dam uh, using the pre trained neural net model. Um, so, yeah, I think that's in a, in a summary, uh, in, like in the conclusion, that's it for what again. All right, I'll stop sharing. So, uh, any questions? Uh, before okay. that, I'll just okay. drink some water because I've been speaking for some time now. <laughs> right. Uh, so thank you very much, Nave. Uh, so now over to the audience. Like, do you have questions that you would like to ask? Remember to unmute yourself when you start talking. So are there any questions? And I'm seeing no intention, so I'm going to ask mine. Uh, the very first question I would have is like, how does it like how you, you've shown us like all the kind of individual things that you're doing? How does it all tie together? Uh, right. So, I mean, from my understanding, so you first you would kind of say, OK, I want to understand uh, the flooding dynamics or potential flooding dynamics of this region. Uh, so I'm kind of looking at the river that um, that I'm interested in I'm, or looking at the city and, and all the river uh, rivers and their tributaries uh, that are um, uh, uh, contributing, you would be looking at kind of dams maybe that are, of course, further away that come through the tributaries. And uh, then you would say, OK, we can simulate like based on all this elevation data um, that, that we kind of get that we can kind of simulate what happens, like if the rainfall is this and this and this kind of what what would be the contributions and how would the water levels rise and how would they flow is. And did I understand that correctly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, essentially what we've done is we've used different aspects of uh, hydrological modeling and created different models. 
So Watergate is sort of like a model of models. So you can probably select which model is more most accurate for your uh, scientific reporting. So I, I know that quite a lot of hydrologists rely on the rational method for smaller areas. So if you have a smaller area, then you can use the rational method. If you require hexagonal cellular automata, that is something we're looking forward towards implementing. If you if you think that you're uh, if you're studying a region um, that is affected by the dam uh, and you know the how the dam functions, then you can use the bathymetric functions that we mentioned in um, in the dam part. So it's sort of like a model of models. There's not really one sp specific you know output uh, that you in enter a city and it gets you know uh, enter city enter the rainfall um, and you get you know a prediction. Although that is something that uh, I'm working towards creating with the Indian Space and Research Organization this summer. That's something that I hopefully plan on achieving because I realized that that would be very important for hydrologists. But essentially, right now, it's a model of models, uh, essentially. Yeah. Right. Okay. So at the moment, you have more like a library of like different things that can do different stuff and what you're looking. And that would be kind of my next question. Like, if you want this to be used, of course, it would be good to have like one program. Uh, which uh, I think good luck <laughs> with Paul Brown to get something compilable out of this um, uh, that, that people can compile and that uh, people can uh, run where they may maybe then select okay um, so we're going to select the region so you know like uh, the user selects the region and uh, then kind of selects okay which kind of models do I want to use here and uh, then the thing runs and then it produces like a report if you you want uh, like that uh, that people can then kind of analyze and then see what's going on is is that the plan doing such yeah. a thing in the summer yeah that's the plan uh, that's the plan for for, for now um, of course it, it it probably requires a lot of more effort to compile everything than it actually does to make everything because uh, well you have to get rid of quite a lot of redundancies uh, in the code uh, and to ensure that it actually compiles so you know uh, that is something that we're looking forward to and I'm currently studying computation, uh, computational complexity. So the Wolfram language has a lot of inbuilt functions. Uh, the Horton Stroll stream model was such a function. Uh, I'm not really able to sort of get the computational complexity of each inbuilt function because that's not readily available. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of running tests to experimentally determine the computational complexity of those uh, functions. Uh, so so once I do that, I'll be able to sort of utilize the most efficient functions uh, and the ones that are faster, which will able, uh, which will enable me to create a uh, sort of one model, which is which compiles relatively quickly as compared to, uh, you know, using each one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Principal, I've seen that you've raised your hand, so you want to ask a question? Remember to unmute yourself if you want to say. No, oh, he's leaving. <laughs> OK, I guess that's not asking a question then. OK, are there any other questions before I keep asking my questions? I have one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so um, somewhere in between you mentioned about finding the depth of the river using the neural network, which uses the pre-trained model, the single image depth perception in the wild. I would surely read about that, but um, can you just briefly describe what features does it have and why is the reason you found that it would suit well for this project and for your task? Well, uh, if I'm if I'm being honest, it is something that was inbuilt into the Wolfram language, so it was easy for me to use rather than sort of importing a, a you know Python uh, that a neural network that was written in Python to the Wolfram language, um, which is quite complex, if, especially if you have different versions of Python in your local runtime. So that is something that, uh, you know, that was the first thing that I gravitated towards. It's inbuilt, and so it's easy for me to use uh, in the Wolfram language. But also, if you look at the uh, net chain, it has, um, you know, uh, a convolutional there. It, it basically uses, uh, you know, convolutional neural networks to predict the depth of a um, image you and it's like a massive database by the way in fact uh, let me just sort of probably share my screen uh, about this model just give me one second yep 
So this was released in 2016. It has 501 layers and around, you know, 5 million parameters, uh, which is uh, very important. Um, and this was, uh, you know, state of the art uh, because it has like a 28.3% uh, disagreement rate uh, on the NYU depth V2 data set which is uh, almost close to the state of the art, uh, which was um, which was available even in Python. So I realized, you know, why go to the extra effort of, uh, you know, importing a Python neural network uh, and configuring uh, this one function in Wolfram language known as external evaluate. Configuring that is very painful, uh, especially if you have different Python uh, modules in your um, local environment. But anyways, I digress. Um, that's the main reason that I used it. It's, it's quite, close to state of the art and it's inbuilt in the Wolfram language. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then I have two more questions. Uh, let's start with uh, one more technical and then uh, one kind of more general. My technical question is, uh, I mean, you use kind of lots of image uh, data analysis, uh, right? Um, yes. And I understand like you've been looking at the different examples. Now you've um, you've uh, had us a closer look at this a neural network that Wolfram language incorporated for the depth for finding the depth from images. Mm, even though I don't know what the what the kinetic error rate actually means, but like 28% is actually quite high, even though it might be a, like the state of the art. And that, um, that's something that I wanted to kind of ask in general. Um, this was just a particular example that kind of played into this question. And that is kind of how do you assess the errors that you have in, in, in this, uh, right? So this, uh, this is something important to understand also the reliability of your prediction that you get at the end. Yeah, uh, completely. Uh, I see that, you know, 28%, even though it's close to state of the art is quite, uh, it's, it's not uh, terribly great. Uh, you know, uh, and I realized that sometimes models are, are not very uh, accurate. Uh, so if you if, uh, if you recall, uh, for the dam prediction, we used two models. One of them was using pure bathymetric and computational models. Um, so if you remember, we found the uh, using dam contours, we found the area and the volume of the dam. So that was uh, using a computational method. And the second one is using this neural network method. So of course, sometimes neural nets uh, are nowhere near close to the good old fashioned computational methods. I believe this might be, I, I suspect that this might be a case of that. Uh, but uh, as such, I really haven't uh, like measured the accuracy of the pure bathymetric function vis-a-vis -vis the neural net. I know that for the computational method, uh, the bathymetric function, the area is quite accurate. Uh, I'm not really sure about the depth. That is something that I'll need to look into. But yeah, I agree with you uh, that sometimes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Also, the error propagation, right? Kind of, um, if you could, if you can say, okay, like uh, what you could do, for example, is to say, well, I'm uh, taking like a Gaussian um, uh, that I am, uh, where I'm saying, okay, I want a standard deviation to, uh, let's say, my best result, right? So where you do, uh, where you add like noise to your levels, and then you would see, okay, how does my prediction at the end change when I'm running everything through, like, um, and uh, kind of to have some form of metric. Um, um, where you compare like uh, say like the flooded area and an intensity and you say okay so this is a kind of this is uh, this is the deviation so that there is an understanding of things like what what is the error rate that um, is to be expected what i understand is that in, if since we're looking at a particular fixed area of course uh, like if you try to apply this model um, to a particular fixed area then you could go and you can actually then talk to the respective authorities and say okay what what are the actual depth levels here i mean at the end of the day um, this is uh, this is kind of because you don't have access to this information, right? So you're kind of trying to use uh, what um, ideas you have. The same idea which I liked with the bridges um, that they measure like the width of the river. Um, uh, what about tributaries uh, like where maybe there are not so many bridges, but that could be like main tributaries that are kind of contributing water uh, in case of flooding. So they would kind of in, in this model be uh, yeah neglected. Well, I don't know how you would deal with this when, when there are kind of not sufficient rivers over these kind of things. Which yeah, of course so, in the US is unlikely, but like uh, if you're like in other regions, I don't know when 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 it goes like into the mountains in China or something where there's no so much population density, so that the, this could be a factor. Yeah. All right, 
yeah, I agree. Sometimes one one aspect that we've realized is that uh, the lack of data sig significantly hampers any model, not only uh, you know in hydrology, but quite literally any model. So we've done our best to sort of get uh, a list of all the bridges. And of course, if a bridge is not built over a tributary that is still quite wide, well, firstly, that's an area of concern. Why isn't a bridge built? Uh, but secondly, uh, yeah, our, our model will probably not work for that, and that is a limitation that we acknowledge. I also wanted to share something uh, in the world from language. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this uh, or not. Uh, yes. You? I mean, right. for so, me, yeah, yeah. the screen set. All right. So this is sort of like, uh, well, firstly, welcome to the world from notebook format. Uh, we've been doing it in documentation, and this is the actual world from uh, notebook in which most of the code was written uh, for uh, the dam uh, analysis. So this is currently the code that I'm writing with uh, Dr. Ghorbani from the University of Tabriz uh, to sort of predict the morphological uh, change of lakes with respect to time. So this is something, this is like a cool graphic that we created, which sort of uh, shows the change of the Chilu Lake in China uh, with respect to time. And so over here, we use the again we use the single image depth perception net uh, trained on NYU depth v2 and uh, you know uh, so this was a list of images that i got from dr gorbani and i sort of applied the uh, model to all of these and got a relief plot as well so when i uh, actually you know looked at the data that dr gorbani had uh, okay i also need to probably stop sharing because there are a lot of 3d models in this and they'll probably crash my computer uh this uh, sort of entire notebook is around six gig gigabytes so it's difficult to share as well uh so anyways what i wanted to mention is that the list of dates uh and the water levels that dr gorbani presented uh were more or less in line with the um sort of uh, values that I was able to measure using the list 3D plot. So what I did was, uh, not sure if it's in this uh, library or not, if it's in this notebook or not, but uh, what I essentially did was I essentially calculated the depth of the lake using uh, bathymetric functions after using the uh, neural net. So created a list plot 3D and then measured the depth of it uh, and after that, I corresponded it to the actual data that I had, which is the change uh, in depth over area of time. And uh, I believe it was quite accurate. I not really, don't really remember what the percentage was, but more or less, we saw a significant correlation between uh, the variation of depth in uh, predicted by the neural net and the actual variation of depth. So that is something that's quite interesting to look uh, into. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can see it does work uh, like uh, for specific examples quite well. Manat, you have another question. Yes, I do have another one, though it's not very technical. So frankly speaking, I did get a lot of stuff you mentioned in the beginning, but when you went to the end, it'll take time for me to understand that, which I'll read upon after the meet. But um, in general, just asking what the progress, like the path that you followed to do this project, was it something like when you began this, did you have the learning goals or the ob objectives you wanted to meet for this project clearly uh, defined? Or was it like a step-by-step -step process where you found the problem, maybe did some initial analysis and computation and then found out that maybe this could be a next step I could follow or like how was the research process that you went about doing it because yes it, it is an intensive research that you've done so just inquisitive about the process of research that you followed okay so more or less and it's it's probably i shouldn't really admit this but i am uh we experimented a lot like i read a lot of computational hydrology papers and i sort of put the things that i found interesting from each of them and try to incorporate them uh, I remember especially one of my uh, teammates uh, helped me write the code for the cellular automata, and uh, they were quite interested in cellular automata. So I basically, we experimented a lot. And so one person would be interested in one thing, uh, and you know I'd be interested in, let's say, uh, satellite imagery. 
And I try to sort of correlate what we could do in Watergate with that. And then the other person would be interested in cellular automata, and then we'd uh, go into cellular automata and try to predict flooding using cellular automata. And so that is more or less how it went. We experimented a lot. We didn't really have like a predefined, uh, you know, goal. We just thought that it'd be cool if we were able to, uh, you know, uh, get a relatively accurate model for flooding prediction. Um, and we worked on it for like quite a lot of time. So that's essentially it. So I, I like to add here, I mean, experimenting is fine. <laughs> okay, I mean, this is how research works. Um, research doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you will always have um, uh, two parts to research. One thing is like once you've identified a problem, you will have like technical aspects, so where you will kind of do technical steps. So in, in your case, this was kind of reading the papers, identifying the techniques, implementing the ones that you were interested in. And then of course, you will have also the creative side. And the creative side is just like, okay, I need to, I have some ideas, I need to try them out. Okay, so research means searching <laughs> it's not that okay you make a plan and then you follow it and then you arrive at the end and then you're done right because otherwise i could simply tell a computer to do exactly all these kind of steps um so uh it's a creative process so i don't think that you have to be ashamed by saying oh you know we didn't have like a full plan and we just started reading started getting interesting things and we're building on top of things because this is how it works <laughs> okay this is how it works in general so that's fine okay Princewell, you you know raising your hand I don't know if you're talking because we can't hear anything, but I can see that you're talking. So I can't hear anything. Don't know about Nave. Do you hear what he's saying? No. Could you maybe type it out in chat? Yeah. So maybe type it out in the chat. Okay, if this is now, so I'm not seeing anything yet. So if this is kind of longer thing, then maybe this is then better to post in the Discord uh, so that you can uh, dis discuss it there. Uh, if this is now so long, if that doesn't work, I don't know what's going on because I'm not seeing anything being posted. Okay, so principal, maybe, oh no, that here he comes, brilliant. All right. Did you plan on considering other water systems like drainages and canals when you were creating your model? So I looked at mostly lakes and rivers, didn't really consider drainages and canals uh, while in terms of flooding. Uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not really sure what kind of impact they might have uh, in terms of flooding analysis. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if there's something that uh, if drainages and canals can have like a significant impact on flooding analysis, then I'll definitely look into it. I do know that I believe that there is a lot of inbuilt data for canals in the Wolfram language. So yeah, that is something that we can definitely look into uh, as well. But uh, again, I'm not really entirely sure about the uh, you know impact of that they would have uh, on flooding analysis. I, again, I could be terribly wrong, but that, that's just my opinion. 
I think Nino tries to say something, but I can maybe comment uh, on that a little bit. Uh, so, of course, um, uh, this is something uh, which kind of then makes things critical when there is like not sufficient drainage, if the canals are like uh, uh, are full, right? If, if it cannot drain, then this is suddenly your water levels start rising rapidly. Um, so I'm also not sure whether this needs to be incorporated in the flooding analysis per se, uh, but of course, kind of that understanding like how water levels will change. For example, if you rise a dam, if you use like drainage systems where you flood like um, the, I don't know what that's called in English, I only know in German, uh, what, uh, you know, the land that is used to for, uh, to uh, release excess water that, uh, that you need to do, so which um, uh, usually like every river has. Uh, so that would of course then affect like how the water would be spreading and what uh, uh, people basin? like hmm? the drainage the drainage basin do you mean that like when the river the amount so, the... so you have lands like that are dedicated to be flooded right so which are kind yeah, of outside yeah, yeah. the city so so these kind of things of course they will then kind of change uh, the water level so as i'm saying it's not for the analysis per se uh, but like is is something that could be kind of added as an add on kind of what the relief would be and, and how the flooding would look like if they're kind of relief options in that sense. So I think that would be an addition to your project to kind of then bring in like the relief of what what's uh, what is possible like if if the canals are working and if the if if, if the flood is kind of spread like in the areas that it should uh, which uh, again would need to be probably indicated because or you would it would need to be indicated on the map so that you could calculate that into your yeah, uh, kind of like how much water is coming in behind okay come to think about it this is actually something that's quite uh, pertinent in delhi especially because you also have like canals that get over flooded during monsoon and, and so that could possibly lead to an increase in uh, water levels uh, so yeah uh, yeah I'll, I'll definitely look into it thank you for the suggestion so it's it's more about kind of like how fast they increase in water levels like that they increase in water levels because th if this happens then and then it's known as a problem and then suddenly the water starts rising very very fast which of course needs to be taken into consideration when you when you plan evacuation procedures okay so uh, 15 minutes over time i think that's sufficient so thank you very much much i think there are kind of lots of questions that can be asked nave has shared the resources you have them on linkedin and you have them of course now in the announcements on discord uh, so if you're interested to learn more about that then of course please uh, try it out and i'm sure like if you then ask nave then he's not going to refuse you if you have more questions okay awesome thank you very much nave so one uh, round of uh, applause for nave for starting us off here a uh, very interesting project extremely lots of work <laughs> that you've done uh, together with your peers uh, so uh, very interesting thank you very much and uh, there will be more uh, coming up yeah more projects coming up we'll be trying to advertise them a bit sooner <laughs> than this one uh, but hey this is the first in january uh, uh, so uh, yeah keep um, uh, watch the space um, as i uh, already did with this one we're also going to be advertising them on linkedin so you can join via that as well. Okay, thank you very much, guys, and I'm going to be seeing you on the server. Thank you. Bye so bye. Much.